Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Gary Talbot, and I'm joined with Avril Townsend and our special guest, Murray Morrison. If this is the first time you've been to one of our TNT webinars, I hope you find it useful. Um, if you're back for another time or for fourth time, fifth time, uh, myself and Avril started these uh, during lockdown as a way to give back to teachers. Um, and we've had some amazing guests. Um, so you want to check out our YouTube um, channel. There's tons and tons of webinars that we've done in the past. And tonight's webinar is all about maximising student memory and how to try and make that stick. Um, and again, again, we're joined by Murray Morrison, uh, who has kindly come along and uh, going to talk to you a little bit about memory. And we're also going to share some strategies that you could use in your classroom to help your students to memorise or remember information. Good evening, everybody. Um, so just as usual with our communication, you've got the Q&A function to ask any questions that are specifically to us um, or to Murray. And um, you've also got the chat function, which you can see everybody, um, a lot of people are already chatting in there already. So that's just to share any ideas and just to communicate with other participants that are attending the webinar. So that was our little introduction. So we're going to hand you over to uh, Murray Morrison who is going to start the first part of our webinar. Over to you, Murray. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you, Avril, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me on your webinar, and I'm looking forward to, to talking to you all about this topic, which is something that I feel really passionate about. Uh, from my background in teaching originally and into building the software company that I run called Casmi, uh, my whole focus was about trying to help my students really learn the skills of maximizing their memory and not just for revision as we run into the exam season, which is obviously what focuses the mind somewhat, but also about sustaining longer term habits to help build memory uh, so that revision perhaps isn't so necessary. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is is like the quote unquote, the science of learning or the science of memory. But much of it's much more kind of anecdotal and hopefully accessible and stuff that will ring true for you. Uh, probably lots of it you've already heard before, um, but hopefully there's some interesting or different insight for you this time. Um, so first of all, just to give you a little idea about what Tasma is about and what my background is, is, aside from the teaching side of things, I worked a lot myself in music and in sport and with musicians and athletes. And I looked a lot at how they practiced and how they built strong habits. Um, and everyone knows what people say about practice. But if you're thinking it's practice makes perfect, uh, I would take exception to that. I always say, and I was always told, practice makes permanent. And the same thing as you come towards, as your students come towards revision, or as you try to embed retrieval practice techniques in the classroom, uh, it's about getting your students a really sustainable way to rehearse that memory, to practice the knowledge that they need to absorb and to do so in a way that's that's correct, if you like. That is, if, you're, if your students are practicing things wrongly or in a poor way, then they risk building weaker memories and weaker foundations on which to then scaffold to the next level. So uh, that's kind of the principle on which I built the program I did, but also the principle on which I did a lot of my teaching um, and try to get my students to kind of get good results. So first of all, the kind of the, the research on revision and learning before I kind of go into reciting uh, Ebbinghaus's Forgetting Curve and all those other things which we'll come on to and you may have seen elsewhere. I'm just going to first of all talk to you about the Gombok. Uh, and for those of you who don't recognize that word, slightly unusual word, this is a Gombok. And this is an amazing object invented by some Hungarian mathematicians. They were looking at shape and science of shape and balance and equilibrium, and they wanted to find and build a shape that would, wherever you put it, in whatever direction or orientation, whichever way up you put it, it would self-write. It will rock one way and then another, and it will always turn itself the right way up, which is pretty cool if you're into physics and, and designing shapes. And having done all that work, they looked at nature and realized it already exists. It's a tortoise shell, not perfect, but very, very similar shape, has the same qualities. Now, when we talk about the research and the, and the, and the high practices, the, the, the kind of focused practice of learning and revision, my kind of 
um, thesis is these practices have existed for a long, long time, and most evidently in fields of sort of elite performance like sports and music. So when I think about the methodologies for good revision, the methodologies on which I built my program and the things you see ring tr very true in, in research, for example, from uh, the meta study in revision and, and memory techniques from John Dudlowski, they really chime with what you see musicians and athletes do. So that's kind of my background starting point. How do they approach their regular practice in order to turn a learned behavior into effortless mastery? So what I'm talking about here is not just, I've learned how to do this thing, I've learned how to solve this equation, or I've learned these kings and queens of England or whatever these, but, but in order to learn it in such a way that the retrieval of that knowledge is effortless, effortless mastery. Well, first of all, they have both a micro and a macro focus. So they're looking at their whole game, they're looking at the whole subject, but they're also then really zeroing in with a micro focus on their problem topics. Um, so that's a kind of way that they're spinning plates. They're looking at every aspect of what it is they need to learn. Some things they need to spin those plates often if they're weaker topics, things they need to practice more, but they never take their eye off the other plates that they need to occasionally give a little push. So it's about, it's about having that macro focus of looking at the whole range of material you need to be revising. And that's something really important to get your students to think about and look at, uh, not just to do that thing where, okay, you've got broadly two archetypes at the extremes, the ones that hate revision and, and feel a bit anxious about the exams, and they'll, they'll go and revise the thing they're good at so they feel better about themselves. Uh, that's obviously not good. And then you've got the ones, uh, and I think I was maybe in this camp, a little bit anxious, think, okay, I know I struggle here. I'm going to spend my whole time practicing this thing that I'm really not strong at. Improve it a little bit. And meanwhile, ignore all the things that I was quite good at, and then go and make a mistake on that in the exam. So that focus of micro and macro and keeping all those plates plate spinning is something that is, every musician does that. No matter how good they are, they practice their scales as a warm up. Um, and then the nature of the practice, we'll go into a bit more detail, is I believe really vital that it contains plenty of iterative repetition, not just repeating the same thing over and over again, not rote learning, rote practice, I don't really approve of that, but repetition with feedback and adaptation. So you change what you're doing, you're evolving what you're doing. And the more regularly and frequently you can get your students to be practicing, the better those memories will form and the more long term. So um, I'll just go back a second. Uh, I, I make the analogy of learning to tie your shoelaces, something, something that uh, my own son is you know, quite small and hard for him to learn. But once you've done it every day of the week for a couple of months, it becomes something that's second nature. The other two points here, are just I think there's two, are about balance that those elite performers, they not only do they work very hard in their practice, they also take good breaks and rest. And that's so vital. I'll probably come back to that a little bit. And then the other thing is, even when you are working hard and when your students are working hard, if they're those kind of assiduous students you want to encourage to do well, it's really important that they don't overexert themselves, I believe. Uh, the 90% rule comes from a story, possibly apocryphal, about some sprint team who were told to give do, do their 100 meter run as fast as they could, give it 100% effort. And then later they were asked to just put one in at a 90% effort. And it turned out they all ran faster at 90% effort it's because they don't have all that muscle tension of trying super hard and resisting their own movement. As soon as you relax a bit, you can flow a lot more. And that's, I think, another vital principle that I really took into, into the way I work with my students. Oh yeah, there was one more, and that is using all your senses. I'm going to come back to that in a, in a bit more. So what are the core principles to make knowledge stick? There is a meta study that you may already have read or heard of, but if you haven't, I'll try and send a link through uh, via Avril and Gary to share with you by a, a, a scientist in America called John Dunlowski, uh, a social scientist, and he looked at lots of studies into revision and really came out with the things that universally worked in revision. But I like to think of this as really um, making pearls. So if you think about the oyster that makes the pearl, it only makes the pearl because there's a bit of grit in there. Okay, so a little bit of resistance, a little bit of irritation is what helps make that coating stick and build that pearl. Uh, so when I work with my students to do their revision practice, I'm always trying to set the challenge with a little bit of resistance, a little bit of pain, 
uh, but not too much so that they engage, but the knowledge sticks. Um, but what are we doing? We're talking about self-testing as being the most clearly effective technique in memory forming and revision. Self-testing, because it drives your engagement and it gives you immediate feedback. So you can tell where your strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, and then the second part, which we talked about a lot in the last few years, is distributed practice. The idea of spacing. I'll go into the forgetting curve a little bit more uh, in a slide or two, um, if I can remember my notes. Uh, below that, as being the other kind of vital techniques that really prove themselves to work, are around elaboration and inter interrogation, sort of more deep questioning of yourself. So getting your students not just to uh, recite a fact or answer a question, fill in the blank, but also to kind of scrutinize that knowledge with more um, effort into kind of how do I know this or can I explain this to my uh, eight-year-old brother? Can I explain this to my grandmother? Because that effort to rephrase what you've rehearsed in a different set of words is what then starts to build that pearl. It's what, it's what starts to make that memory more robust and more strongly formed. Um, Gavril, Gary, Gary and Avril, I know, are going to have lots of slides in the second part of this uh, in this presentation to talk you through lots of exercises your students can do to elaborate and interrogate that knowledge. Um, and the last one, again, interleaving is often thought of as being the same as spacing. It's not quite. It's about variety. It's about mixing up your revision. So plenty of variety keeps the mind fresh. Uh, and that really does make a big difference. So my own son's revising now for his year three exams and I'm telling him you've got to break up the topics five minutes not five minutes but one session of this one session of that and keep variety in, rather than staring at the same page for a long series of time so we're going to a little bit more about self-testing and the kind of the basic principle of this so there's a well-known uh, technique the Leitner method my software taskway is based on the Leitner method um, but uh, obviously a little bit more complex but essentially it's to take that knowledge uh, those retrieval practice cards or flashcards or whatever it is you need to do and break it into these boxes. I've got five boxes because um, that looks nice on the page. But you get your boxes and then you take your questions, your unknown questions, and you start sort of somewhere near the middle or a bit below the middle. And you, as a student, you ask yourself, do I know this? Now, it might be in the form of a question and answer with the answer on the back of a flashcard. It could just be an hon honesty system, looking at that bit of the specification or the syllabus do I know that? How confident am I? And if you aren't confident or you don't know it, you demote it into the box to the left. And if you are and you do, you promote it to the right. And over time, the knowledge, the, the facts that you need to learn and revise or the techniques or whatever it is, get promoted towards the, the done end or demoted towards the problem end. When we talk about strategized practice or adaptive practice, it really is about finding where those strengths and weaknesses are so you can focus on the weaker ones. Now, this is by way of indication, if all my knowledge for this subject was broken into these five boxes after a while, then you're gonna have uh, a, a probably a fairly normal distribution, so to speak, uh, which this looks like. This was taken from some of my data here. Now, I want to do a bit of practice from every box, and I'd want to look at where's my median line, that kind of middle line, and do about the same amount of below the line as above the line. Now, that's going back to my point about keeping those plates spinning. Some below, some ones you're struggling with, some ones you're confident about, because you never know when something up in the blue box might have got forgotten and get demoted again. So keeping that distributed practice across those across those different topic areas. So that's the Leitner system uh, as a basic kind of template for retrieval practice and memory building, whether this is in the run up to exams or whether this is three years out from the exams as a preventative measure to really embed knowledge. So we do this in, in TASMI as well, where we, we do this quizzing uh, and we represent that knowledge as a tree, in fact, and over time your tree grows and then you're able to visually see very quickly where your problem areas are. There's a couple of orange leaves there. And if we click on that leaf, you can see that problem question you're getting. And that might be something that then the program will anyway build back in, but you can link out to that to a resource. So that's the sort of way we try to build that into the program as well. Uh, I say it's a lightener method, but you can see we've got you know a more complex system, but it's the same principle. So the next part I talk about was spacing and distributed practice. Uh, the, the sort of classic piece of research about this is the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. That is this contention that when knowledge is first taught, 
it's forgotten quite quickly in a matter of minutes at time, uh, sometimes, or you know, by the time they leave your lesson, they've forgotten half of what you told them. It probably sounds quite familiar. Certainly, uh, I've experienced that one. Um, but of course, if you can revisit that material, you give that forgetting curve a bit of a bump up. So the idea, of course, is that fastest rate of decay in the first couple of minutes or hours is when you want to hit that again with quick repetition. So what it does, sorry, my slides are a bit kind of basic, is it puts that curve that was there up another level and bumps it back up to the top. Now the rate of decay of this curve suddenly is less than it was before. So the gradient's maintained, but it's being pushed up. And if you repeat again, next time you get to about that same level of forgetting. So a little bit later now, it's a longer period of time can have elapsed, but you can still get that push up to kind of reinforce knowledge. And over a few iterations, you can get that forgetting curve to really abate and uh, attenuate, as you say. And after a few repetitions distributed after a day, three days, a week, three weeks, three months, you can get to the point where that knowledge is really strongly fixed. So again, that's kind of what I would always encourage my students to build into their, into their practice. So coming towards the end of what I was going to talk about, really, um, I looked for a picture on for my slide of somebody studying and I saw this one and I thought really, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Um, to me, here's a student who is sitting, staring at her book, staring at her notes and trying to make that knowledge go into her head. And that feels like something very familiar to me for my students and, and myself. Um, what I feel like students need to learn and we need to keep communicating with them is you need to mix it up. You need to be quizzing yourself, testing yourself and breaking it up in lots of varieties. So the first thing is, I don't know why I wrote tomato balance. There's a technique, uh, which again, you probably all know called Pomodoro technique. That is to say 25 minutes on, five minutes off. And those five minutes off are really off, not still sitting in the same chair and just like looking at your Nintendo, but getting out of your chair, getting out of the room, getting some fresh air and resetting. Uh, so 25 minutes on, five minutes off. And when you come back, do something else. Don't do the same thing again, two sessions in a row. Um, so that's the interleaving part because that builds variety and freshness and match readiness. In an earlier TNT webinar, a brilliant one with a guest called Jonathan Tate, he talked about the difference between interleaving and spacing. And he, I think, described interleaving as being like, well, you, you're a tennis player, you practice your tennis shots over and over again, but interleaving is when you don't know what shot's coming next and you're ready to react and you're ready to move and you're on the balls of your feet and you feel fresher and brighter. And that's training, not just can I hit the same shot over and over again, but can I be ready for the unexpected? And that's what interleaving helps to bring, it freshes the brain. Um, I've mentioned already the, the, the sort of the interrogation of knowledge and the, and the sort of, exp can I explain this to my grandmother? Well, what that really does in my belief is is to stimulate metacognition, stimulate a deeper level of understanding about the knowledge because you're start having to query to yourself, do I know this? Why do I know this? How well do I know this? And can I explain it another way? So rather than just staring at your notes, can you get involved in some discussion? And this is something that I know uh, Avril's notes and Gary's notes and that follow come up with lots of ideas that go beyond just reading the notes and start to get interaction with others. So not just reading your notes this is the, the last thing. And this is, do you all remember, um, what was it called? Learning styles, where somebody is a kinetic learner and somebody is an auditory learner, and it's now kind of like widely debunked. Where I think there's a tiny kernel of truth to this is that if, you, if instead of just staring at your notes, you read your notes aloud, so you see them, you process them, you speak them, and you hear them all at once, and you stimulate all those different parts of your brain, it's going to be stickier. If you speak aloud and then dictate it to yourself and you write down what you've just said, it's going to be stickier. You're going to build stronger memories because you're using more neural pathways and you're keeping your brain guessing. Um, and as for writing down those notes, uh, it's really important, I think, that as well as just reading, you don't then copy them down, but you say, what of that paragraph that I just read did I not know? And that's what I'm going to write down. So to distill it down into smaller and smaller nuggets, because all of those bits of processing, all of those bits of pain are the grit that make the pearl build the memory. 
Um, and open a window. I was just reading a message about, uh, reading a blog about how meetings are pointless and we shouldn't do meetings. And I'm sure we all agree with that. Um, but it was talking about how when you're in a room, especially a room with other people in a meeting, the level of carbon dioxide rises and cognitive function falls scarily, dramatically. So getting your students to open a window, get some fresh air or go outside every 25 minute session is really, really vital for stimulating that, that cognitive function, keeping them, keeping them going. Final thought, I want to just talk to you about this guy, Donald Rumsfeld. He used to be the most controversial Donald, uh, not so much now, um, but uh, not everyone's um, favorite person. But what he did, which was slightly unusual, was answered a question that somebody put to him at a press conference, um, which was widely laughed at as being one of the most nonsensical things someone had ever said, go away, Donald. Um, one of the most laughed at things at the time. He talked about things we know, things we know we know, things we know we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. And everyone thought it was sort of silly and, and joked about it for a long time. Um, but I think there is something really, really vital in this. This is what I kind of want to leave you with. Rather than thinking about just that sort of lightness system of knowledge getting promoted, I think of it like this. This is my Rumsfeld law of rehearsal, mem rehearsal memory. When you start as a student to engage in your revision, there are things you don't know and you don't know you don't know them. And you're not going to know you don't know them until you start to engage in some kind of quizzing or you start to look at the specification and really start to do some analysis. So it's so vital in building memory that you start with that discovery process. Discovery, look at the textbook, look at the analysis and write down the things you didn't know. Once you've done that, you know you don't know them because you've taken a look at it, you've seen them. So the first thing for your students to do as they build towards good memory is to build awareness, to know what they know, know what they don't know. They may also look at the textbook and find some things that they do know. Um, but working out where their gaps are and being aware of the gaps is really important. Then they know what to start doing about learning where the gaps are. Next thing, they get to the point they've learned stuff but do they know they know it? Is it really solid? They've practiced it or, learned or, or looked at it until they can, can get it right, but can they do it until they can't get it wrong? And the last bit is then to really, really assimilate that knowledge, confirmative practice, and get to the point where they not only know the material, but they know they know it and they're confident. And what ultimately is gonna get good performance on the exams is not just knowledge, but confidence and knowledge of your knowledge. So that's the kind of, Rather than the likeness system of the boxes in rows, I always want to think of that S curve of taking people to awareness, then knowledge, and then mastery. And that's uh, that's sort of my final thought to leave you with. I hope that was uh, helpful, interesting. I really appreciate your time. And thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Murray. It was um, really detailed and I've learned some stuff uh, from that as well. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's quite scary, isn't it, that when probably when you were younger and you were studying as a student, as, as I was, you know, no one ever told us this stuff, did they? Um, you know, and I'm just so pleased that teaching has advanced, um, you know, so much. And we're now looking at the research in terms of how we actually remember and how we learn things because um, we can really help our students with that. So thank you very much for that, Marie. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mary. And um, what we're going to look at now is some actual memory strategies or activities that you could use in your own teaching. Um, you might be a tutor or you might be a, a teacher in the classroom. And again, you know, these can be used for, for memorising information. It doesn't have to be just for an exam or for an assessment or anything like that. These are some tools um, which myself and Avril have used over, over the years of teaching. They're not our own tools. We haven't created them. Um, they're done by tons and tons of of teachers who've written books and blogs and, and stuff like that um, and we've just thought wow these are great ideas we'll use them in, in our classroom so we're going to share some of those strategies some of them you might think oh they're going to really work in my classroom some you might think no nah, they wouldn't um, but we just wanted to give you a, a range of different ideas that you could try and going back to Murray's point you know I think it is sometimes um, good I remember when I was started out teaching I was trying to find some ways to get my students to engage in revision um, instead of just doing the same stuff that we might do flashcards or whatever. And you know, it can get quite tedious for, for the students. So I always try to research as many different strategies as I, can, as I could to help the students 
um, keep that that learning and that memory fresh. So the first one uh, I've talked about before at a webinar is something called chocolate bar. So essentially, you just get an A4 piece of paper. You would fold it into eight squares. It might be a topic or a couple of lessons ago that you, you've done of um, um, knowledge. And what you do is you get students to write down in one of the squares everything they can remember in one minute about that topic, about that specific piece of knowledge. And then what they would do then is walk around the classroom and they would ask seven other people to share some new piece of information about that topic, which that student has not remembered. And it's about getting them to discuss their ideas and share that knowledge with each other. And then once you've done that, they would write that piece of knowledge in one of their squares and then they would go to another per person, et cetera, et cetera, and move around until they filled all of the chocolate bar um, piece of paper. And then I think the key thing then is to have a bit of a discussion with the class and, you know, and call on students to, to say, right, what information have you got? And sometimes that can bring up some misconceptions where you can then, as a teacher, address those with the whole class uh, and go through anything that students you can see is misconceptions from when you taught it. So that's something you can use, which I've used quite often, uh, and, and students seem to really enjoy that one. So the next one is um, something called the lift test. So you can use this for, uh, it might be, for example, a, a full uh, practical method in science, or it could be for a particular chapter in, in, a, in, a, in a novel, or it could be, uh, you know, an extended piece of writing that you want them to become really familiar with. Um, it could be an argument or just a, a key bit of information that you want the, the students to grasp. And what you can do is you get the pupils um, into a pairs or into groups. Um, and then what you need to get them to do is summarise all that information and prepare a five minute pitch on it. Um, you give them enough time to, to work out the five minute pitch. And then just before they're about to present, you then give them the bit of a, uh, this is where the lift bit comes in. You, they've only got one minute in the lift on the way down to the car park. So they've now got to um, give that information out to the other students within one minute. So what that does, it gets them to summarize all the key information first when they're preparing the five minute pitch, but then it gives them uh, that extra challenge of summarizing it even further at the last minute um, so that they can really summarize it and give specific key points in their one minute summary to uh, the, the students that they're presenting to. And I think as well uh, on, on that Avril, sometimes you know students can find that difficult you know to write a five minute pitch and um, so you know if you've got students with SEND in your class and they might find that difficult you know provide them with a you know a template of, of sentence starters or a you know a guide of what things they need to include in that topic it might be keywords that they can use and um, so I think it's important with some of these things that you know if you have got students that might struggle with that that you you know provide them with some scaffolding to be able to to, to do it successfully um, Next one um, is something called placemats. Um, and this idea comes from at Mr. Luzette. And what he does is he gets pupils to work together, recording their information, sharing it with each other, and then summarizing it at the end. Uh, and again, going back to what Murray says, it's about getting that information and breaking it down and putting it into a different formats. So you can do it in, in two different ways. Um, the first one is you might have a, a topic in the middle of your piece of paper. So, you know, the bigger the piece of paper, the better sometimes. And then you would get each student within the four boxes, as you can see on here. So it would be a person sat here, person sat here, person sat here, person sat on the right. And each person would write about that topic. And then what you would do is get them to discuss what they had written as a group and then summarize it in the middle as a, you know, a final answer of what they would then present to the class. Another way of doing it is if you've got something that's an exam question that's quite detailed, so it might be a 12 mark question like you can see on the, on the board, which might break down into separate things. Um, so if, for example, as a scientist, we might be doing genetic engineering and that could break down into you know, what it is, applications, um, positives and, and negatives of it. Each person does their own. They then all can contribute together and then they've got that, that knowledge shared with each other and then they can use that to help them to write something you know a longer extended answer um, in the question 
So the next one, uh, this one can work really well um, using mini whiteboards. So it's called Draw It. Um, you can use mini whiteboards or you can give them a large piece of paper and ask them to, to summarise a key learning point in, in just pictures. Um, so you can extend this um, by putting the pupils into groups or teams and get them to, to come up with the drawing themselves. Or you can do it individually as well. So like I said, with, with the mini whiteboards, you could just give them like a keyword or a key learning point on the board and then you give them a set period of time for them to to illustrate how they feel they can you know project that key point but only using um, a drawing and um, what you can then do is if the pupils are working in pairs you can get them to to look at each other's uh, drawings to see if they can improve on them or give you know give feedback to each other and then you can also get the students to to like write a full summary of the full topic using people's um, diagrams that they've drawn. So that can work particularly well, um, if, you know, if you've got a step by step method or, you know, in PE, if you're wanting to talk about techniques and uh, of, um, you know, athletics and things like that or other examples of sport. Another one um, which is similar to, um, I think, what Murray was talking about in terms of a tree. Um, so all you would need for this is just loads of post-it notes and then you could draw the picture on your whiteboard or have it projected on, the, on your screen um, of a tree. And then on each branch, you'd write a subcategory of a topic. Um, so you might be doing something, you know, about the rise of Hitler, for example, and that would be your, your topic. And then on each of the branches, it might be some of the causes or reasons why um, Hitler rose to power. And then what you would do then is get students to write down on the post-it notes bits of information and get them to come up to the board. I mean, you could they could do it as a group if you wanted to as well. You know, just each of them has a you know an A3 sheet with a tree on it, and get them to put the post-it notes onto the different branches to try and categorise it. And then you can obviously get the, the the students to come up and present it. You could go through any misconceptions, or you could ask the, the class is there anything missing from this branch. So you could do it in a, a number of different ways, but it just makes it a little bit more visual in terms of you can see how you would break that down. And then you might even want to then do an extended piece of writing or answer an exam question based on, on that information you've just done as a class, remembering back to, to a topic you've done in the past. Right, this one uh, gives an, a, a really good element of competition. Uh, so you can set, the, set this up in a number of ways. You can get them in teams or they can work individually on this one. Um, so what you do is you give, um, you have a, a set, complete set of questions. So you could have any number. So for example, you could have 10 on separate sheets of paper. Uh, it can be useful to have them on different colours, then it's easier for you to, to keep track of, you know, how many. So when they bring in 10 questions back, if they've got 10 different sheets of paper, you know that they've done 10 different ones. Uh, and what you do is you have all your questions at the front of, on, on your desk and they come up for one question at a time. They take it back. If they're working in individuals, they can answer it themselves or if they're in a group they then nominate a, a runner who will then collect the question and then they return um, that to the teacher's desk the teacher can then mark it and then once they've got that correct or they check the answers they then take the second one etc and then it's it's the ones that have got, got, got the complete 10 sets of questions completed at first so it, it gives a bit of a competition you just have to make sure that the classrooms are appropriate for the pupils to be moving around um because it can get quite competitive yeah and I, I mean i've done this quite a lot Avril, and one of the things sometimes which can happen if you've got in your class a group that's really you know really quick and they get to the, the, the end really quickly. It doesn't give the chance for the other students to go through all the questions. They can sometimes get a bit demotivated. Oh, well, they've already won. You know, those kids have already won, so I'm not going to bother anymore. So what I sometimes do is, you know, I sometimes say I'm also going to choose a random, you know, place number and I'll write it down on a piece of paper. And let's say, for example, if you come sixth and your number gets drawn out, you win as well as the people who are in first. So it just has that little bit of, um, not always about the person that comes first, but, you know, gets more and more to participate instead of giving up halfway through. So just a bit of a thing if you've never tried that one before. Another one, continuum. So you, you may have used these um, quite a lot. So it might be an exam question or a piece of knowledge where you would need students to write an extended response that has lots and lots of different factors to it. Um, you could type those out onto cards or you could 
get the pupils to write them down or you could write them down yourself and then you, you create a continuum line so it might be a big you know piece of string ac across the classroom or it might be on the floor or on your board your whiteboard um, and you get the students then to put each of those bits of information or factors at a different point on that continuum line and the key important part of this is then to get them to write why why have they put that 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 factor is something really important why have they put it is less significant um, so there's certain activities or certain things that you could do with that especially if it's got lots of different parts to to the question um, so you can do that just on a piece of paper on the desk or you could do it physically by doing a you know a big question line or you can actually get them to stand up at the point where they think is the the more significant but again it's about that explaining why they've done that so this next one, um, you can use these, it's basically called fill my brain and you can have like a template of a, a brain or the pupils can draw out the shape of a brain or you can have it already pre-cut on like sugar paper or something like that. Uh, and you might want to ask them to fill it with knowledge uh, from the topic that they may have learned in that particular lesson. Or if you're using it for, for revision skills, it might be that they to do it, you know, do like a brain dump within that brain on a particular topic that they might not have done uh, for a while ago. You can also ask them to list in keywords or it could be bullet points or it could be relevant drawings or diagrams, anything at all that's linked to that particular topic. Once they've done that, you give them a set period of time and then you can get them to highlight what they think is the most important point out of, of their little brain. And then they can discuss that um, with the pair, with the partners if they're in group and, uh, you know, if they're in pairs or in, in groups. So different ways of doing that, uh, the pupils can do it in pairs. So they could both fill one brain up uh, between the two of them and you can give them a time limit. Uh, which you know is deliberately not enough time to, to fill the brain completely or you can give the list of keywords from a topic and then they have to to fill them in and they have to try and use all the keywords in the in the sentences within the brain and discuss why those keywords are important and like I say you can have uh, the brains um, already pre-cut um, and use like sugar paper and marker pens and then they can present their brains to the rest of the class or they can do it within small groups um, something which i think is similar to what murray was saying in terms of flip it so you give pupils a4 sheet of card and you have a blank grid with uh, rectangles on it 16 rectangles which they could cut out themselves or you could probably pre-cut them if you wanted to do it a lot quicker on one side they write a question which is a short answer and on the other side you would write the answer um, once they've done it, they'll just lay out the cards on the desk um, and they answer the questions and, uh, as quick as they can and turn it over. Um, like we said, you could do it with the Lightner method where you put it into different boxes or you could just leave the ones they got correct answer side up and the ones they didn't um, return it. And you could go back to that in you know two or three lessons time. You could get them out again and say, right, try it again, try it again. Let's see if you can remember any answers or answer the ones you got wrong last time. And it's just about that continuous practice uh, and going backwards. Uh, like you see there, you can, if you want to add a bit of challenge, you can say you've got so, you know, so much time to do it and see how they can, you can do it in that, that quick time. Uh, this one's called learning grid. So you can have different uh, numbers of squares on the grid. Um, but this one um, in particular I'm going to talk about has got 12 numbered squares on, on, on the top. Uh, sorry, on the grid. And what you can do is fill that grid with either 12 keywords or a variety of different keywords, or it might be pictures or, or diagrams. And then what the, the students do, they, they work in pairs and they roll the 12 sided um, dice uh, twice. And then they would use that to get the coordinates of the uh, particular grid. But so they get two separate, sorry, they get two separate um, dice rolls. So for example, if they get a six and then a five, they would have to look at the uh, item that was in uh, square number six and then the item that was in square number five. And then the challenges for that is to then make a connection or the, to correctly link those two items, whether it's a keyword and a diagram. And, and that can be quite challenging and getting them to, to make connections between those two particular 
uh, keywords or diagrams or whatever it is that you've placed in that. So I've used these before um, where I might put, you know, a selection of keywords for a particular topic in there. And, and it just adds that bit of challenge and gets them thinking of how to make the connections. If you don't want to use the dice, you can use a, a number generator or have the students pick out the, the numbers in a box or, or a little bag or something like that. But that's uh, quite a nice one with the dice because the, the pupils like to, to do that. And I guess I think it's just, you know, that they're getting them to talk about it and them actually to link topics together and link different bits of information together and how they relate, I guess. Something else uh, called Let's Go Shopping. This can take quite a, a long time to do. It can take a whole lesson. Um, so what you might do is you prepare a list of key terms or factors associated with that topic. Um, so, for example, this one is the, the rise of Hitler. And then you would add price tags like you would in a shop to each different factor, depending on its importance. So you can see there's some examples of monetary values. And then you would say to people, right, you've got so much money, you've got to say which ones, if you're doing an exam question, which ones would you buy with that, with that budget that you've got? And they would then provide a shopping list for pupils to write down the, the choices and reasons, that's the key thing, for why they've chosen to buy those particular things. And then once you've done that, it's about evaluating what they've written, a class discussion. Um, so things like, were the prices fair? Would you have adjusted any of the prices? Um, and I guess it's them exploring those different factors and getting them to understand them and bring that knowledge back from what they did when you taught them in the past. Um, so that's something which can take quite a lot of discussion, a lot of time, can be quite challenging. Um, so again, you might want to think about how you would um, scaffold that for students that, that may need that extra support. Okay, so this one's called um, market stall. So you might have done uh, something like this or some, something similar or call it something else. Um, but basically what happens is if um, you've got half the students who set up a, their market stall and what they have to do is stand up behind a desk without any notes uh, and they might they need to be able to answer a question uh, for the students. So you split them into two. Um, and the students are given a, a set amount of time to prepare notes on a particular topic. Then you split them up. So one stands behind the desk and then the other partner will go around the different market stalls to try and find out their answers and, and get notes on the different topics that each student has revised or that they have studied in that particular time. So by doing that, the students get to go around each market stall and find out information from each um, stall holder or market stall owner and they can collect a lot of information around different topics uh, throughout that lesson and then what they can do then is then have a swap so the the student that went around all the different stall owners would then become the stall owner on on their topic and then the partner would get to go around and visit uh, the remaining uh, students that are delivering their specialism on their little topic. So that's a quite nice one, a good way of them finding out lots of different information, but it's not being delivered by the teacher. They're getting to learn that information independently themselves and then the relay relaying it to, to students in the class. So they're, they're doing quite a lot of repetition um, and they're, you know, they're refining their information each time, every time they're presenting it to other students. And one of the things that I've done in the past with this, if you, you know, if you, you feel a little bit up to it or you can afford the budget, sometimes you, I, I did it with crisps. So I gave each group, you know, a different flavour of crisp or a different type of crisp. And if people's got, you know, some questions right at the stall, then they would take some crisp off the stall and they would go around. Um, but again, that's just my personal preference, trying to make it even more exciting than, than it should have been really. But that's just another idea. Something else which... Um, we were talked about before is something called showdown and um, people's working groups of four. One person in the group would be the quiz masters. So they would ask and uh, tell the pupils if they got the answers right. So what I would do as a teacher, I would prepare some, you can see on the right hand side there, some quick recall questions. And I, if I am the quiz master, I would ask the other three uh, students in my team the, the question. So question number one, and then they would answer on the whiteboard secretively to themselves. And then when everyone's answered, I would then say, right, OK, uh, everyone, show me your answers. One, two, three, go. And then I would then praise and say, well done, you got it right. And I'd sort of keep a tally score of who got the amount of questions right. And it just kind of puts the onus on them quizzing each other as opposed to the teacher doing it. 
Um, and, and when you do this, you'll find that there's this real buzz in the classroom in terms of students are really, really getting really involved and engaged with, with this activity. Um, and you then go around at the end and you'd ask people, you know, which question were you struggling with or, um, you know, who won in your team? And you can reward each um, leader in, in the group who, who got the correct answers the most and stuff like that. So it's quite a fun one to do. So the last one for me, I think, um, this one's called Find Someone Who. Uh, so the teacher, you, you prepare a, a worksheet with questions on, um, and then you might have played this, uh, you know, a, it's quite often an icebreaker on insets and things like that, where you have to find somebody who's got, um, you know, a particular dog or a, has been on somewhere on holiday. But you can give uh, all the students um, the information on the class, and then the teacher, uh, gives every pupil a question sheet and then they need to go around the classroom and get the answers off other pupils in the, in the classroom. Once they've got the answer from another student, they can just put the, their initials in that end column uh, and that you just need to make it clear to the pupils that they cannot answer the questions themselves and they must have evidence that they've collected it from, from somewhere else. So again, it just gets them thinking about it, it gets them communicating, talking out loud, and, and it's just to stimulate that memory and hopefully help to, to make it stick. Uh, obviously, it's a good idea if you, you can uh, make it a bit more competitive and give little, like little prizes for the, for the winner. Um, but like Gary said before, just to keep that motivation, it might just be that you give um, everybody a, a prize if they manage to collect all, all the answers in from uh, in, within the time frame. Okay, another one is paper chains. So this is quite simple. Um, you can just get little pieces of paper to cut out. Students would then write a keyword or a phrase or a quote or something like that on the paper. And then they would have to link those together and be able to explain why they've linked um, each of the keywords. So it's a little bit of a, a chain who can make the sort of longest paper chain and, and all the different things link with each other. So and something else, um, similar, a big flow mind map. So what you might do is you get you know, a big sheet of, of sugar paper and give pupils post-its and little bits of card. And you could get pupils to create like a really big um, sort of mind map, um, you know, interactively as opposed to just doing it on paper and writing it out and get them to work collaboratively to show how the topics link and different parts of the knowledge link with, with certain things. You could give them a template if you wanted to support them of what sort of the branches you would do if you did it um, and model it out. Um, or if you've you know, got a class that, that you feel could, could do it, just give them the piece of paper and let them go. Um, again, if you're just getting them to remember it, um, sort of learn it for the first time, you might just do it with the textbooks or the revision guides. Um, or if you want them to actually remember it from time ago, let them try and do it off the memory. Uh, so this one is um, quite, it's quite a good one for, for remembering like a story. So if you were uh, it took, walking through a house, is one way I've done it is if you're walking through a house, um, you can link it to like a story or it could be like a practical method. So if you walk open in the front door, it might be you make that connection to a particular task within a method. And then as you go through like the hallway, you might make that connection, visualize it and then link that to the next part in the story or it could be um one way i've seen it used as well before is in english so they they imagine walking into a house and then they go into like uh the living room and they meet a particular character in there so it helps them to visualize make a connection between the room that they're in but also the character and then they can go into like the kitchen and it might be a different character in there and it just helps them to to make connections between um, it just helps that that memory. It's called memory palace. Sometimes it's called as well, uh, where you're making connections with a room or another feature of, of, of characters in a book. It might be parts of the story or it could be like a, a method um, if you're talking about like a, a practical method in science or something like that. So there's quite a few if you have a um, if you find that quite something that you'd be interested in. There's quite a lot of examples online that you'll be able to find that are linked to your particular subjects to see how that works. Um, something else which is quite uh, interactive is four by four post-it notes. And um, you can see the picture on the screen there. So you give pairs, 16 post-it notes, they would arrange them in a four by four grid. And then they would use either just the knowledge if they're recalling it from, from uh, past memory, or if they need a bit more support, give them some 
textbooks or class books to try and help them memorize that or bring things back to them. And they would then have to write a, a keyword on each of the post-it notes. And then what you might do is swap groups. So one group would go over to the other group and they would try and um, write the definitions of those keywords. So this is good if you just want them to get that basic understanding of what certain key terms mean, which they might use on, you know, sort of recall um, questions. You could also do it so that they could rearrange the post-it notes as well, so that they all link together. So once they've got the definitions, they could go back to their original uh, four by four grid and they could move them around to try and get them so that they link on both sides or on all sides of, of the post-it note, which is quite a challenging thing and getting them to look at how the, those bits of knowledge connects with each other. So you can do it for a topic, you can do it for you know a couple of different topics. Um, and it's quite good, at, and I, I, we now will teach science to link the disciplines of biology, chemistry, physics sometimes to link those together. And then the last one we've got for you today is uh, something called the Cornell note-taking method, uh, which was uh, developed from a, a university professor in a way of students to memorize and summarize the work. So I'm just gonna play you this. Um, it's, it's only short, so you can see, if you've not used this before, it's a really good method to teach students. The Cornell method is a way of taking notes. A professor at Cornell University created this system to help his students keep their notes organized and useful. Here's the technique. On a sheet of lined note paper, draw a horizontal line above the bottom six lines of the paper. Then draw a vertical line from the top margin down to this horizontal line, about a third of the way from the left edge. Put today's date at the top of the sheet. Take down your notes in the large note-taking right column. Your notes should consist of the main ideas of the lecture, video, or textbook you are studying. Keep your notes efficient. Paraphrase longer ideas. No need for complete sentences here. Use phrases that leave out parts of speech such as articles, conjunctions, prepositions, and auxiliaries. Think about how people write Twitter posts or news headlines. Use symbols and abbreviations where possible. Include quick sketches of the material when appropriate. In the left Q column, jot down relevant questions and keywords. Do this during your note taking or immediately after. Writing questions and prompts helps you clarify meanings, reveal relationships, and establish continuity. This Q column will also assist you with your future reviews of the material. Within 24 hours of taking notes, Write a brief summary in the bottom six lines of each page. Condensing your notes down to a couple of sentences helps you make the topic more clear in your mind. When you are studying for a test or quiz, you now have a concise yet detailed record of your previous classes. A method of review is to cover the note-taking column and look only at the left-hand column. Say aloud, in your own words, the answers to the questions and prompts indicated. Spend at least 10 minutes every week reviewing all your previous notes. Regular review of your notes between tests helps you better comprehend new lectures. It also enhances your long-term recall of the material. Try it and see for yourself how helpful this method can be. I think when he actually did that with his students, uh, the ones that did that method actually remembered a lot more than the students that didn't use that method. So that might be something you want to use. So we'll come to the end, that's uh, our strategies. We will um, put this presentation um, in the email we'll, we'll send out to everyone uh, and on our uh, YouTube channel when we publish the video. But here's some uh, things, books that you might wanna buy. So we've got 100 um, ideas for secondary teachers in terms of revision. There's tons and tons of ideas in that. Um, a brand new book, which has just been um, written by Helen uh, Howell and Ross uh, Morrison McGill. And there's tons and tons of different ideas and strategies in there. Um, another book, Sticky Teaching and Learning. And then there's two blogs where, um, or bits of information where you might be able to get loads of other ideas from. So one of them is by a, a teacher in the UK called Amjad Ali. And he's got a, a website called Try This Teaching. And on there, there are tons of different ideas that you, you get from other educators that are, are posted on there. And then Michael Childs, who again is another uh, amazing teacher from the UK. He also shared on Twitter last week, I think it was, lots of assemblies and, and presentations that he'd done in his, his school around revision and, and that kind of thing and getting them to remember. So we, we'll send this PowerPoint slide out um, so you can click on those links and you can access some of those materials um, 
for you know for yourself so you can use in your classroom uh, so I would just like to say a, a massive thank you for Murray for, for de delivering his part of the, this evening's webinar. It was really, really um, great of him to, to give up his time to help to help us out and help out all the teachers and, and, and everybody else who's participating this evening. Um, and also a, an absolutely massive, big, huge thank you to Elementary Technology who they allow us to use this software so that we're able to, to deliver to deliver these webinars and um, so thanks again to all at elementary technology and we always do competitions at our webinars if you're new to this so we gave away some fabulous prizes at the last one uh, which was all about cooperative learning so we've got leslie armstrong and rebecca wright both on copies of the fantastic book uh, evidence-based education gave away um, an assessment training CPD, online CPD, and Ross Stevenson um, won that one. And then finally, um, Inner Drive gave away two of their fantastic books. Um, and Stephen Davidson and Talib Ali both won copies of those. So well done to those people. And if you're lucky enough, you might be able to win um, two gift vouchers, £25 each for Amazon. Um, also the coveted uh, TNT mugs. And also, Tassima, thanks to Murray, um, we've got two real trees, um, which uh, are up for grabs as well. But to in order for you to enter those competitions, you just need to kindly fill out our feedback form. And Gary, can you make sure you put the right one in the link? So I think we've got a habit of popping wrong one in there. So just make sure you pop that link in now, Gary. So that will go into the chat now. Um, if you click on that, it won't take you long at all to fill that out um, and just make sure that you've completed that because the competition will close on Friday. Um, so you have a good chance of winning. So please fill it out and be honest. And um, the draw will take place the week beginning the 30th of May. So at the end of this month. So good luck to everyone on that. Um, social media, if you've not um, followed us already, we've got a Facebook group. So if you just type in TNT Teach and Learning, you can join us on Facebook where we announce all of our webinars. Same with our Twitter or our YouTube channel, which has got tons and tons of different webinars on different topics around teaching. And you can watch for free um, and lots of different ideas that you might want to use. And that's it. So if there's any questions that you want to ask uh, before the end, we'll, we'll uh, try and answer a few now. I don't think there's um, any in the um, Q&A section. No, just check. We've just got some lots of thanks from people again. So... Thank you to everyone who, who has given up their time to do this. But I think the key important thing is if you, you know, just try and use some of those ideas, get someone to come and watch them and see how successful they are in your, in your lessons. Um, and I think that's how you'll keep improving. Yeah, I think it's great to have all those comments. So good luck, everybody. And thanks very much for uh, joining us this evening. And hopefully we'll see you all soon. All right. Bye, everyone. See you later. See ya.